title of today's message is Something is Missing. Something is Missing. The message is two-dimensional. To the unsaved, I hope that the call will be to repent from your sins and turn back and have a creative link with your Creator, or rather a relationship that is experiential with Him. And to the saved, it is a call, a cry, a plea, and a beseech from the bottom of my soul to come back to the place where you first met Him, the place where you first fell in love. I'm going to read some statistics to you now on suicide. It came to my attention as another few celebrities were announced dead through hanging this week. Obscure, maybe not everybody knows. We know the big ones, the Marilyn Monroe's, the Kurt Cobain's. We know the other ones like Robin Williams recently and Amy Winehouse and Michael Jackson, all of these folk who perceivably have reached the pinnacle of what the world could offer in terms of fame, wealth and power. They had everything the God of this world would have promised them. Yet their demise came in such a sorrowful manner, devoid of hope, they committed suicide. I then looked at the statistics globally. And I found to my utter sadness that approximately a million souls commit suicide every year on this planet. And if we do the math, the breakdown is one every 40 seconds takes their life. And they project in 2020 it will be one every 20 seconds that takes their life. And then I look at the statistics of how many Christians are on this planet and it says 2.1 billion. And I ask myself, something must be missing. If 2.1 billion, a third of this planet, express themselves to be part of the body of Christ, who are spirit filled, who are moving in the anointing of the Holy Ghost, who preach hope and give an account for the hope within us in season as we are asked and instructed to, then how can it be that this world is in such the state that it is? Something's missing. Twelve spirit-filled men tumble this known earth upside down. Twelve. Twelve. Without the aid of email, media, planes, Yet they were able to take this gospel to the farthest reaches of the land and give hope to many. They weren't people who just said their prayers. I subject to you today, they prayed in the Holy Ghost. And they obeyed the word. They were filled with the Spirit. And they prayed every day and every night. How do I know this? Well, it's in the Word of God. It's written clearly. Saints of old who had intimate prayer lives with the Master, their God, their Father, and we will be looking at two such people today. We can learn from both. One is Solomon, King Solomon, and the other is Daniel. Unfortunately for Solomon, I'm not sure of his salvation. It's not my job to know whether he is in the Lamb's Book of Life if the name is written there. I'm more concerned right now for us and also my family and my children. But according to what I read, it doesn't look good. And also Daniel, I want us to look at his life and draw inspiration from how these men walked and talked with God. And because they had such a close relationship, they cried like God. They talked like God. They wept like Him. And they were broken like God because they were so close to Him. It's not a secret. It's all through this gospel. The disciples saw miracles, saw preaching, the like of which this earth will never see again when Jesus of Nazareth walked here. But they never once asked them to teach us how to do miracles, Father. Or teach us how to preach like you, Father. They said, teach us how to pray. 
this what's missing? Corporate prayer is wonderful. But if none of us here had a personal prayer life before we came in, we might as well forget the corporate prayer. It is about your individual intimate relationship with your Creator, who cried out to Adam in the garden, Where are you today, Adam? And of course we know why Adam was separated. But today, why is that call out to us? Where are you, Thomas, in the evening? Not being answered with, Here I am, Lord. I'm in the garden with you. Surgically operate on my heart. Make me more like your son. So I pray today it's a check for us. Are we reading the gospel more than we did three months ago? Are we praying for time longer than we did six months ago? Is there progress in your life? Are you moving forward or have you stood still? And if that is so, then at the end I beseech you, cry out to him to bring you back to the moment you first fell in love. And I hope to prove using the gospel that it's not just a nice to have. Actually, it is a Christ-ordained commandment that he brings through the Apostle John in Revelations later. I'm going to read 1 John chapter 4 verses 9 to 12. Would you turn with me to 1 John chapter 4? verses 9 to 12. 1 John chapter 4 verses 9 to 12. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us his spirit and we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world i read up the 14 for good reading good reminder there it says no man has seen god so that ought to be a spirit checking you whenever a mormon says that joseph smith saw the father son and the holy ghost what of one or Charles Taser Russell from the Jehovah's Witness, or any other cult or man that claims to have seen God the Father. Be weary. For the Bible tells you that no man has seen. It speaks of love. And God is love. This is true. But our definition of the word love has become warped. God is love. Well, if God is love, then understand this. He is ferocious about his righteousness. He is zealous about his judgment. He is love. And if we as preachers do not give you the full spectrum of his characteristics, then we're not doing you a service. We are holding back the whole truth. Because in that love lies mercy, but equally wrath. In that love lies righteousness. And the Bible tells me he's angry with the wicked every day. Not my words. I'll provide scripture for everything I say today. So we ought to give a full spectrum of the word love. Our understanding of it has changed and sloppy evangelism and dare I say demonic and Lucifer orientated teaching has taught us this soft, coochie Jesus who pats his sheep and you see the pictures in many living rooms and whilst he does do that, we forget that love had by the sixth book of Genesis killed the entire world apart from eight people. That's what love had done. It took eight and put them in an ark and slaughtered the rest of humanity. That's love. That's in the beginning of our book. In the middle of our book, love put Jesus Christ on the cross. And he saw it well pleased. Love saw it well pleased that his son, his beloved,
beloved, only son was bruised for us. Love put Jesus. And in Revelations, love comes back again on a white steed. Yeshua. And blazoned on him is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And as he rides that horse, the revelation, the Bible tells us there's a sword between his teeth. And his cloak is soaked in the blood of his enemies. Is that the love they preach still today? Well, something is missing, brothers and sisters. Something is missing. It's time for us, me included, to wake up. There is a dying world out there. Not just those who are committing suicide, for we know their destiny. There are those who don't know Jesus. Don't know what was accomplished 2018 years ago. And what would we ought to say to them? Not everyone's calling is an evangelist. I may even agree to that in a debate. But is it not your calling to be a witness? Is it not our calling to say, many great men have walked this earth? Kings, counselors, legionnaires, warriors, conquerors. But no man speaketh unto the unsaved and say, no man has left such profound impact as the penniless carpenter's son, Jesus of Nazareth. When you speak these words to them and you pray for them, watch dead bones rattle and come to life. And then we look back at the world now. Cannot be in the case that it is if there are two billion Christians. Well, of course we know there isn't. To profess with your mouth is one thing. But to live according to his words and his statutes is an entirely different matter. <coughs> to obey his words. Christ said, if you want to follow me, abide in my word. We don't use abide anymore in the English language that often, but we use dwell. Do you dwell in the word of God, young man? If you dwell in the word of God, then you would know where to go at any given moment. I don't dwell in this kitchen, so I can't tell you where the knives and kitchen are kept. But you come to my house and I'll tell you exactly which cabinets are open if you want the teaspoon. And we ought to be the same with the word of God. If we dwell in here as Jesus, our master, asked us to, we would be able to at any given moment, skillfully with a double-edged sword, come back to the place where you can impart into somebody's life. And do you still believe this can breathe life? Am I alone? When was the last time your soul leapt for hallelujah when it came to read the gospel? Or has it become a duty or worse still, is it now sealed as if it's not even in your house? Oh, your soul should be leaping for that moment because you're coming to the bread of eternal life. Come eat and taste that it is good, Jesus said. So here we are. Time seems to be moving quickly. We're going to now look through Solomon's words, his life, his study. But just beforehand, I want to read you the last words of Steve Jobs. Does everybody here know who Steve Jobs is? Are they yes? Yes. 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 Nope, the song knows. So the founder of Apple, the original founder of Apple, Macintosh, just now last week announced as the first trillion dollar company on planet earth that's right Steve Jobs here are his last words I reached the pinnacle of success in the business world in others eyes my life is an epitome of success however aside from work I have little joy in the end wealth is only a fact of life that I am accustomed to at this moment, lying on the sick bed and recalling my whole life, I realize that all the recognition and wealth that I took so much pride in have paled and become meaningless in the face of impending death. In the darkness, I look at the green lights of the life support machine and the humming mechanical sounds and can hear the breath of the God of death drawing closer and closer to me. Now I know when we have accumulated sufficient wealth to last our lifetime, we should pursue other matters that are unrelated to wealth. Should be something that is more important. Perhaps relationships, perhaps art, 
Perhaps a dream for younger days. Non-stop pursuing of wealth will only turn a person into a twisted being like me. Supposedly his net worth was seven billion when he passed away. A man who owned many yachts, a man who founded the biggest IT company out there today. Oh, what sorrowful words. And that poor nurse who had to type it in the iPad that he created himself. Can you imagine her quivering and thinking, my goodness, you, who have everything that the prince of this world, the prince of darkness, can offer, and you come to this place with these words? These words actually reminded me of somebody else's words, King Solomon in Ecclesiastes when he was reflecting upon his life at the end. Vanity, vanity, I hear it whispered in the front. Vanity, vanity, vapor, vapor, all this for nothing. What's this emptiness that I come up to? The throne of God I'm about to. And we'll see that reading and why it is that he said that. But first, we need to travel through Solomon's life and understand, wow, this man lived a life, a son of David, who became the king of Israel. A man who God said, I will bestow upon you wisdom, not just ever seen so far, but ever to be existed. So we can safely say a correct statement would be, the wisest man to ever live, outside of Jesus Christ. That's quite a statement. Let's study his life. Would you turn with me, please, to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. And we're going to read... From verses 5 to 14. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 to 14. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Pause. When you walk with God, when you have an intimate relationship with God, He comes and draws near to you. It could be a dream could be something far more profound as well. But he will reveal himself to you. God Almighty has come to Solomon in a dream. And he says, what do you want? Anybody here want that to happen to them? Amen. I want that. I'm glad one of us do. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. Pause. Parents, the walk of a father has touched the heart of God. Their sons will receive blessing upon the walk of David. For David was a man who was after God's own heart. And because of that, Solomon recognized, because of the way my father walked, I recognize that you honor me. Verse 7, And now, O Lord, my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but a little child, and know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast been chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. Pause. He recognizes that in his power, in his might, he cannot accomplish that which he is being called for. We ought to humble ourselves. Shouldn't we? Before we go out and evangelize, we humble ourselves and, Father, in my mind, I can't do what I'm about to do. And Solomon recognizes that. And he says here, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself a long life, neither hast asked for riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honour, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if, the big if, 
If thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. Wow. Praise God. Isn't that, you know, let's be honest here. If God turned up and said, anything you ask for shall be yours. There are nine out of ten folk who wouldn't have asked for that. But what? Solomon, before Christ preached, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. He seeks the kingdom of God to judge thy people for their sake. Give me understanding and discernment. He sought the kingdom first. And there are prosperity pimps out there right now tele-evangelizing all across the God channel that prosperity is what you should seek first. But today we see it's the opposite. See how dangerous a doctrine that is? We don't ask or give to God so we can get. That's what prosperity pushes. We seek the kingdom of God. <coughs> and God is saying, look, and even though you haven't asked me, I will make sure there is no king that can be matched unto you while you live, Solomon, when it comes to material gain. And no one will ever have as much wisdom as you. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. This is an amazing, this book, I mean, when I was in the world, we saw this book as a, a fable or, or not interesting and Harry Potter and World of Warfare and Game of Thrones and people exalt these things. But I tell you now, in this gospel, in this word of God, is magnificent, extraordinary and wonderful accounts, not fables or stories, accounts that really happen, that history is made by we ought to run back to this. Entertainment is a scant substitute the devil has given us for joy. And the joy of the Lord will fill you when you hear such accounts of men who learnt, who walked and talked with God and received wisdom and discernment. Turn with me to 1 Kings 8, the next stage of Solomon's life. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Only two verses, 1 Kings. Chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. And it came to pass when the priests had come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the temple. So we've just seen what God has bestowed him with. He's now at the next stage of his life wanting to build the temple of God upon Jerusalem, Moriah, which his father was unable to do. And he's built the temple of God and God himself has just turned up. And the priests couldn't minister anymore, sir. They had to step away. The glory of God, the weight of his glory came into this building. Did we come this morning asking or expecting the weight of God to fall upon? we stop doing that? Did we fast like when I pray last night for this burden? Are we beseeching God Almighty to descend upon it like he did in the days of Solomon? It's the same God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. He's immutable, unchangeable. It's, he hasn't changed. We oh, yeah. have. I'm going to look at Daniel Lake. These men were pre-Pentecost. If anything, we have something over them. The Spirit of a living God dwelleth in us. Permanently, if you want. If you work and walk, rather, according to His Word. These guys didn't have that. The Spirit of the Lord fell upon them at times. We, through Christ, saying, look, I'm going, so I send a comforter to dwell in you. And yet, look at all they achieved. He built the second, the temple, and it, the temple was filled by the glory of God. Wow, Solomon is witnessing some great things there. Let's turn to chapter 11 to see the next stage of his life. Chapter 11, 1 King, we're staying there. Verse 14 and 15. Sorry, can I have a glass of water? Is that, is that okay? Thank you very much. And the Lord stirred up 
an adversary. Sorry, just before we go there, stage three we're on. 1 Kings chapter 11, thank you very much. Verse 1. But King Solomon is the but, the heartbreaking but. A man who we just read got the wisdom from God, walked with him, talked with him, built the second temple, saw the glory of God, prayed to Israel as they stood up when he prayed, thanked God for all things. A man whose wealth at one point was measured according to the Bible as 666 talents of gold. I know some of your ears pricked up at that number. That's the Bible saying 666 talents of gold he acquired in one year. And it was his, if you like, per annum salary. Today's equivalent, that would be 1.1 billion US dollars. Salary. Just the gold. I'm not talking about all the other stuff that he had. 1.1 billion and he reigned for 40 years so you knew his net worth would have been 40 billion at that time. Had all these things. But, 1 Kings 11 begins with a very sad but. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonites and Hittites. And of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them. Neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon clave, as in he held on to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And you can read on for good reading to verse 11, as time seems to be evaporating in front of me. For good reading, know this. His heart was turned away because he knew. You know what the word knew in the Hebrew and the Greek context and the lexion Hebrew here? It's to know a woman like Adam knew Eve. He knew these women. And we think to ourselves, how can you do this, Solomon? I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this too. Surely you who saw the glory of God and all that he gave you, but isn't it so easy to look back on those achievements and see that God would somehow put that as a merit for us on our CV of the list of things to do and perhaps offer out some sort of compromising judgment upon our souls because of what we've done? Well, today I tell you, that isn't the case. His mercy and His wrath will be meted out accordingly. Cannot the judge of the entire earth judge correctly? Solomon may well have been guilty of also thinking and looking back upon all that is done so you can afford me a little leeway with this particular vice that I have. To lie from the pit of hell. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be holy. Pure. He's coming back for a pure bride. One who is blemishless. He wouldn't put such standards upon us unless we could achieve it. Through the Spirit of God. He wouldn't say, be holy as I am holy. But Solomon fell. And he fell badly. And in verse 14 and 15 it says, The Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon. Hadad the Edomite. And he was the king's seed in Edom. And for it came to pass, was Edom. And Joab the captain of the host was gone up to bury the slain after he was smitten every male in Edom. Pretty sad ending. Doesn't really tell me after that. You know, I want you to read it. See if you find it. Come and let me know. Don't really see the end of Solomon. I don't understand where he is. But like I said to you, worry and tremble rather, with fear and trembling upon thine own salvation for this moment. Well, had he been walking with God, would he have done these things? on a daily basis if he was walking with God on a daily, meditate upon the word day and night. I thought I'd reach the pinnacle of my prayer life and I'd had one hour clocked in the evening. And then somebody told me, you do realize that's 5% of your day on a 24 hour clock. Yes, <laughs> I shriveled in embarrassment. That was just the evening. What is the morning like? Are we not told to praise God in the morning? And then in the evening, thank him for his mercy and grace. 
and meditate during the day? Is it not becoming more of a challenge to do that? But we can still do it. Amen? Because if we don't, like Solomon, we are all susceptible to the wiles of the enemy, who is around like a roaring dark lion, seeking to devour whom he can. Let's look at Ecclesiastes. fact, because of the time, I'm going to ask you to read 1 to 18 at home. But he uses the term vanity, vanity. All this is vanity. And if you read down to the bottom of that, you will understand it's a man with a heavy heart who cannot fathom how and what went wrong, really. Read it. It's enlightening reading. I tell you, Ecclesiastes is something we ought to read. So why? Why is it so important that we have to have intimate prayer? It is the only thing that's going to keep you and fulfill you. There is nothing the world can offer that will give you that sense of, I'm full. I'm filled with joy. Not happiness. Happiness is an emotion. But joy. Dudene is nodding, he knows. This coal that's burning slowly. And despite what comes, it's still burning with joy because you are of Him. <laughs> He's watching over your life. This must be His will for me. In the middle of a trial, you can say that. It's the only thing. And it's the thing that we ought to have. And by the way, it is the first thing the enemy will come after. Your prayer life. Daniel 6. I'm going to read from Daniel 6, verses 4. To 15. Actually, I'm going to read 19 till the end. So I've written here, if you're running short of time, read 19 till the end instead. Daniel 6. So two things I want to leave us with that this intimate prayer life and walk with God will give you. One is power. The power that all those suicidal Hollywood stars crave but never got. They were counterfeited, or rather they were fooled by the fraudulent one who promised them power, but it ends in not power. Whereas in Christ, you have power. Well, what power do you ask? Bravery, to show strength and take action. Daniel 6, I'm going to read 19 to the end. The backdrop of this story, by the way, is in the time of King Darius, the presidents and the princes put a law together. A lot of you know the story. But they said, you cannot pray to anyone but Darius. And if you did, then it would be punishment by death in the form of the lion's den. And we see that Daniel didn't let the lion's den deter him or his prayer life. We're going to pick it up from verse 19, because that's the verse where the king comes and checks in the lion's den. But just before one hand, know this. Daniel, not only did he carry on praying, he went to his room and opened the window. He wasn't hiding his prayer, he prayed three times. Such was his zeal for prayer, he's sure not going to deter me. Because my God can bring me out of the lion's den. And if the lions choose to kill me, then that was his will. And guess what? I'm in heaven anyway. Where he is. That was a show of strength. When my brother sang Amazing Grace, in the face of terrorism, in the face of AK-47, he sang Amazing Grace. With his guitar. That's called power. Do we have that? Do we crave that? And they shot it. Daniel, put me in the den. You're not going to rock me off the one thing that sustains me. The air in my lungs is not even as important as this prayer life of mine. So put me in the den. And so the king with a heavy heart puts him in the den. And look, let's read 19. What happens? And the king arose very early in the morning and went to haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou serves continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. 
And by the way, let's take the lion. Who is the one who's like a lion? The enemy is like a lion. And he, who is able to deliver you from these lions? God Almighty. Jesus. My God. And I can imagine him saying this quite coolly, by the way. <laughs> I don't think he was flustered. I think he may have been initially, and as his faith came forth and the angel came, he knew everything was going to be okay. And he said, right, I'm going to practice this moment when that king walks through that door. <laughs> My God. It would have been like that. Oh, I pray we have this kind of faith. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me. For as so much as before him innocence he found in me, and also before thee, O king, I have done no hurt to you. Then was the king exceedingly glad. And it goes on, and you see favor shown upon Daniel by this king. Are we in the same place with us? A, would we guard our prayer life in manner? B, would we do it in the face of adversity? I tell you, the day's coming where your job and vocation is going to be at risk if you preach the gospel. It's already here. The day isn't coming. The, the day is already here. Politically correctness, liberalism, madness, where you can't even preach your gospel. The First Amendment will be gone next. Will you still proclaim the gospel? If you don't have a walk with God, I proclaim that none of us will. So power. And the last thing we're going to hear is peace before I close. What else do you get? Peace. Can somebody please read for me 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. With boldness. Please read it. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. That's the second epistle of Peter. Chapter 1. Uh, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue Amen. grace and peace be multiplied as you increase in the what? The knowledge. To know Jesus. To know. Epignos in the Greek. It's epignos that is used when Jesus says, Away from me. I never epignosed you. Epignosis is the Greek word for experiential knowledge. And it's a oh so harrowing, scary verse that he says to a group of believers. Away from me. I never epignosis you. And what do they say back? Well, Lord, we did miracles in your name. I dare say we attended church in your name. We sang in your name. But I never epignosed you. You were not there in the morning and in the night time for me to know you. To experience you. And if you think you'll have an excuse for your lack of devotional life in front of the one who judges correctly, think very carefully. He says to those he loves, away. Love, there's that word again. Love says, away from me. I never knew you. Daniel 4 will stay here to understand that you can have peace beyond this world's comprehension. The backdrop before we read Daniel 4 verses 14 to 30. The backdrop of this is Nebuchadnezzar. The king had erected a statue and said everyone should worship. My statue. And there was a remnant. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. An account we all would have been taught in Sunday school. Who said no. We shall not. But how do they go about this? And why do they have this peace? Daniel 4 verses 14 to 30. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now ye be ready. If ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye should fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship it not, ye shall be cast into the same at this same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Let's look at their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this 
matter. Pause. We're going to hold our silence on this one, okay? Confidence oozing from them in the faith of their protector. That they say, we're going to hold our silence on this. Today the law asks, do you have the right to be? They're taking it for right here. We're going to hold our silence. If it be so, our God in whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will still not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the form of his visage even changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace out one seven times more. And it wouldn't be heated, and, and it would be heated rather. So it was heated seven times, pause, seven times more than usual. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, their hats, and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because of the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace so exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the burning fire. Then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Not a son. The Son of God. There are folk out there who have this kind of a prayer life. And through the fiery trials of this life, you will see them hold firm. Is that you? Well, if it's not, I'm telling you to come back. I'm telling you to come back to your first love. And as we close out, we are going to sing a song called, It Is Well With My Soul. Horatio Spafford, the man who wrote that song, was a man who must have had a prayer life like the one we just heard about in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then, for the story of Horatio is very saddening, but inspiring. First of all, his son dies of scarlet fever at the age of six. He then sends his daughters and his wife over to England to see D.L. Moody preach. And the ship comes to a disastrous end. They die. And he receives a telegram from his wife saying, saved alone. And then his business in Chicago falls to pieces. So, no business. He gets on his ship to join his wife, and the ship travels through the same place where his three daughters had died in the sea, and he pens a song, It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth me, does that peace attend you right now? I'll leave you with these two warnings in the Word of God, and then we'll sing at least one verse of this song. When I say warnings, I mean that with the gravity of love that this gospel says. Hebrews 10 verse 25 to 32, you ought to read when you get home. It wasn't just the Nicolaitans in Revelation. There is also a teaching on this earth today which is called grace superdrive, hyperdrive, and abusing the grace of God. That is, you can live your life just like the world and expect forgiveness when you turn up on a Sunday. When really, he knows that you are not, you are not living according to his words. The Hebrew, the Apostle Paul, I believe, says, For in the old covenant, those who transgress the law would be met with death. How much more so you who trample on the blood of Christ? If two witnesses saw you fall, you would come to death in the old covenant. And he's saying, how much more so? would it be for you who trample the blood of Christ, who sit here as perceived Christians, who yawn in front of me right now, as you're tired of hearing the word of God, well let me tell you now, with the love of God, 
you ought to be very worried. One time in this week you're asked to come and hear the word of God. And you yawn because you're tired. Your heart should be leaping up with joy, drinking up from the cup. Wake up, Christian! This should be the one moment your entire week has been building up to. Yet you yawn because you're tired. Have I gone on too long? Have I? I could watch a game of football, couldn't I, in the world for 90 minutes? Or a concert for two hours? When it comes to hearing of Solomon and David and the Jesus Christ who died for you upon that cross. We get tired. Revelations 2, I close with Revelations 2, chapter 4. I ask the Spirit of God to speak to whoever it is right now as I read this. Revelations 2, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 4. These are letters which Jesus Christ himself writes to churches. And the first church, Ephesus, seems reasonably in a good place until verse 4. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience, and how thou canst bear with, cannot bear with them who are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast had patience, and for my name's sake has laboured and has not fainted. All good so far. Nevertheless, Jesus says, I have something against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlesticks out of his place, except thou repent. You can sing. It is well another time. I want us to sing when I survey the wondrous cross instead. And I beseech you, whoever you are, come forward to the altar of God if you feel this is you that needs to rekindle your fire once again. Not because it's a nice to have. Because Jesus Christ who will come again. Says this one thing I have against you. You are not where you first were. Do you remember when we first felt that embrace brother? When we first felt the loving arms of Christ pick us up from our pit of sin. We weren't all neat and tidy and wrapped up. We were fallen sinners yet he embraced us. And said come with me and he held us. And our hearts were filled with love. And zeal. If you're there still today, then this call is not for you. But if you're not, there are elders here who can lay hands on you. I beseech you. Today is the day of salvation. Let's bow our heads and sing this song. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the of glory die, my richest gain, I can but lost and hope content. Oh, no, my pride, forbid it, Lord, that Oh, 